Welcome everyone to the Wednesday night Bible study at Beacon of Hope Ministries in Clearwater, Florida. We are live streaming on Zoom. We're also putting this on Facebook. I'm not the usual face that you see. We've been doing a series on healing for 19, 19 weeks. Uh, we're taking a short break from that because Pastor Marcia is going to be out of town. So I will be teaching this week on the Bible is the Word of God. Next week, kind of a mini-series for me, next week on Jesus is the Son of God, Son of Man, and the only way to salvation. And then on November 14th, I will be preaching here at Beacon because Pastor will be out of town, and I'm going to talk about the prophecies of Jesus' birth, kind of a prelude to the Christmas season. Everybody else jumped the gun, I might as well too. Amen. So, for Facebook, if you want to see this at a later time, it'll be posted on YouTube. Thank you, Madeline. And we will, uh, you go to YouTube and search for capital B, capital O, capital H, capital M, space, little global, all lowercase. So it's B-O-H-M space global. The B-O-H-M is capitalized. And of course that stands for Beacon of Hope Ministries. So let's jump in. I have a number of friends, for, mostly my former co-workers, who do not believe that the Bible is the Word of God. So, and because of that, that I was talking with Pastor Marcia, that has to be the basic. If we don't believe the Word, if we don't believe that the Bible is the Word of God, then why bother? That's my thoughts. Why bother with any of this? Um, when we had our prayer meeting tonight, we used prayers that avail much, which are Bible-based prayers. And I was marking where every time we talked about the Word and quoting the Word. If the Bible is not the Word of God, then why bother? Okay? It makes no sense to me. But I want to talk first about what the Bible says about itself. And Madeline, I'm going to depend on you to let us know if you can read what I'm writing on the board. Okay? The first point is that the Bible is God-breathed. And this is Becky's, this is Becky's Greek lesson. Oh, thank you. Oops. like a side profile with the eye. <laughs> the apnoestas. Okay? That literally means God breathed. Breathing out. The scripture for that is 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. Verse 16. Thank you, Becky. Which says, and a lot of translations say, in fact, the one I'm using tonight says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction of righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Greek word there is theopnoestos, which means God breathed. That goes a step beyond inspired. I can read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and be inspired. I can read Profiles in Courage by John Kennedy and be inspired. Okay, those are inspiring works. Mm -hmm. This is a step beyond that. In, to say the, the Bible is inspired doesn't go far enough. It's God breathed. God breathed it out. Okay, by the power of the Holy Spirit. God breathed out the Word. And the Word was written. That's why the word is alive, because it actually, it's God breathed. Mm -hmm. And then in 2 Peter, most of you are familiar with this, 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 20 and 21 
knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man. Okay, get that down. It never came by the will of man. But, holy men of God, and some women, I think, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. One of the biggest things people say, well, that's just a, men just wrote it. Men wrote it. No, no God wrote it. Okay? God breathed into the writers of all the books of the Bible. He breathed into them, and they were moved and wrote. Now, I have to say, God used their own personality in their writings. Okay? Obviously, Peter is not Paul. Paul is not John. John is not Matthew. Matthew is not Moses. Okay? God used their own personalities, but he breathed through them the word. Okay? Oh, and if at any time you have any questions, just shout them out. Oh, we will. I'm sure. Yeah, we're rude. Okay. The Lord gave specific instructions to write his word. Okay? In Exodus 34... 27. God told Moses, write down the covenant. Write down the covenant. Write it down. That was when Moses was on the mountain with God, on Mount Sinai, having this conversation with God. God said, I'm going to say it. You're going to write it. And that's exactly what happened. With the prophets. In Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 2 which I do want to read. Did you have a verse for Moses? 30, Exodus 34, 27. Okay. Okay. Uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 2. Well, I'll do verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Okay. The word that came from Jeremiah to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Thus speaks the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write in a book for yourself all the words that I have spoken to you. Moses said, or God said, Write. Also in Jeremiah 36, chapter 2, he says the same thing. It starts out with, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, and the Lord said, Write. Write it in a book. Jeremiah 36, 2. Mm -hmm. Also, and I have to read this one because this has a special place in my heart. Habakkuk, chapter 2, mm -hmm. verse 2. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Yeah, I'll tell you why it's special because when I was in Campus Crusade for Christ, we took this literally and we had a special event coming up. We went through as many classrooms on the campus of Ball State University and wrote on the blackboard hmm. about the event. So, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets so that he may run who reads it. Okay, make it plain. God said, Write it down. Write it down, which is what Habakkuk did. Now, I want to read this. It's a quote. The Bible has a unified theme. 66 books, but one unifying theme. It displays a single pattern of judgment and mercy, promise and fulfillment. Okay? The Bible talks consistently about sin and redemption. And redemption comes through Jesus. Jesus. So much of the Old Testament points prophetically to Jesus. And I'm going to get into that next week and then on Sunday the 14th. So, the go back over that one more time because that was really good. The Bible has a unified theme and you've got... Displays a single pattern. Single pattern. Judgment, of judgment and mercy. And mercy, promise and, and fulfillment. fulfillment. Sin and redemption. Yeah. 
Okay. Which is all summed up, obviously, in Jesus. But it's a unified theme. Yeah, that's good. I mean, that's and good. it from Genesis 1-1 to the Amen at the end of Revelation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a unified theme. Amen. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, we're getting it. So, I want to talk some about what the Bible says about itself. What the Word says about itself. Okay? What verse are you going to? I'm going to Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. And then I'm going to couple that with Psalm 12, verse 6. So Proverbs 30, verse 5, says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. I'm going to read 6 because I have to. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Mm. So, and that word pure there in verse 5, every word of God is pure. That means tested, refined, and found pure. Mm. So every word of God is tested. One can be tested. It's been refined. Over in Psalm chapter Psalm 12, I told Pastor I was looking this one up on my way here. Um, that one you just did, Proverbs 30, verse 5, that's really good. Every word of God in the NIV says, is flawless. Yeah, refined. Flawless, really I like good. that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and just Psalm 12, verse uh, 6, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace. Mm. Refined, purified seven times. So, and I'll add a little addendum to that one. When the church was being persecuted, or when it is now, what's one of the things the persecutors always try and get rid of? The Bible. They, may, they say they do not believe it, but you can bet in when Eastern Europe was under communist rule, China, the Middle East, First thing they come for is the Bible. Mm. The last great persecution of the church, the emperor Diocletian commanded that all copies of the scripture be destroyed. A little side note on that, thankfully his soldiers were not smart. They ended up burning things like cookbooks. <laughs> so, And about what year would this be? That would be uh, 305 A.D.? So okay, the, the soldiers didn't know how to read. No, apparently not. The word is also truth. It's true. Can we guess where I'm going with this, Pastor? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. John chapter 17. We'll start we there. We talked about it last Sunday. John chapter 17. Verse 17. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And Jesus was praying to the Father. And he said, your word is truth. Your word is truth. Yep. Also over in Ephesians, and I know this is a lot of scripture, and I'm running you everywhere. So tell me to slow down if you need to. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Now, I think it's important that we understand this is truth. Yes. This is truth. Okay? Um, one of the prayers, and we didn't get to it tonight, but I'm sure we will at some point again. I think it's number five, to live in the Word. Okay? 
Again, because the word is true, it can be trusted. Amen. The promises of God are in here and they can be trusted because the word is true. The word is also a light. This one's for angel. Well, you know where I'm going with that, don't you? I could sing yeah, it. Yeah, of course they do. 119.105, Psalm. Uh-huh. You got it. Of course I know. Psalm 105. Or, I'm sorry, 119, verse 105. You get a star on the chart. Yeah, angel gets a star. That was so funny. <laughs> your word, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Okay? The word illumines our lives. It takes away, as we read the word, because it is God-breathed, it has the power to shine a light on the inside of us. And that can be uncomfortable. I, I believe me, I know. Sometimes the Lord smacks us upside the head with a little bit of light in our dark places, but that's okay. Also, verse still in Psalm 119, but verse 130. The entrance of your words oh, yeah, gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Letting the word get into you give, gives light. It enlightens you. And that's a wonderful thing. This next verse is found in Deuteronomy chapter 34. Or I'm sorry, not 34, 32. Moses had just given, reiterated the law to the Israelites. This is just before they were going to enter the promised land. And he sang this song about what was going to happen after he was gone, basically. But he says in Deuteronomy chapter 32, starting with verse 46, and he said to them, set your hearts on all the words which I testify among you today, which ye shall command your children to be careful to observe. All the words of this law, for it is not a futile thing for you. It's not a vain thing. It is your life. And by this word you shall prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. I know some translations, maybe NIV says, it is your very life. This is our very life. Says and they, I know, yeah, they are your life. They, they are, are not just the, idle words for you. They are your life. They are, it's our life. We draw life from reading the Word. And it's alive. The Word is alive. So what do you say, while well, we're finding that, what do you say to the person who says, explain to me how God's Word can be alive? It's food. It's, well, it's alive because right. it's living. Right. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 is where I'm headed. Right. The word of God is living and active because it's God breathed. I'll, I will always go back to this word. It has life. It's like God breathed it out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's alive. And Hebrews 4 12 says for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even the division of the soul and the spirit. It gets right down there, if you let it. Okay, and I'm going to talk about some of that in just a moment. It's living and active. In fact, the imagery there is used in the book of Revelation when Jesus opens his mouth and what comes out? Two -edged A sword. sharp two-edged sword. He opens his mouth and the word of God comes out. Right. And then in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 
verse 11. God's talking about his word. He compares it in, in verse 10 to the rain, the rain and snow that come down from heaven. And do not, you know, they water the earth, makes it bring forth, sprout, so we have food. He says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. The word works. The word, because it's living, because it is our life, it works something on the inside of us. It won't return to him void, which is why we here pray the scriptural prayers, because we know when the word goes forth, it's not going to return empty. Okay? Yes. The last thing is a warning. Actually, I have two warnings. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Verse 2. And it's, I think it's great. This comes right at the end of the law, the Torah. You shall not add to the word which I commanded you, nor shall you take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. And then at the very end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, there's some more. Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 and 19. The very last page of your Bible. And this is John speaking. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Those are pretty strong warnings. God says, no, it's, it's done. It's finished. It's done. Don't add. Don't take away. Which begs the question, how did we get it? So now you get, I'll get a history lesson. Um, the Old Testament, the first five books are called the what? Pentateuch. Yes. The law, the Pentateuch, the Torah. Who wrote those? Moses. Moses. Who argues that Moses didn't write it nearly every liberal scholar on the planet really yeah oh, oh, please because they came up with this funny little theory this was back in the 1800s when germany thought it was so highfalutin we know what happened to them in the 1900s the jepd theory Okay? J for Jehovah or Yahweh, E for Elohim, P for priestly, and D for Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. So what they're saying is Moses could not have written, oh, I have to give thanks to evidence that demands a verdict and more evidence that demands a verdict by Josh McDowell and his son for this information. If you don't have it, get it, read it. We have a copy here. The big thing is Moses could not have written the Bible because they didn't have writing. Okay, this was 1400 B.C. Did the Egyptians have writing in 1400 B.C.? Of course they did. And there was also, and it's funny, all these theories how to tear down the Bible. The more archaeology happens, the more these things get disproven. Okay? Moses, there's no reason he couldn't. First of all, he was brought up where? In Egypt. Egypt. In Egypt, in the household in the house of the Pharaoh. Of yeah, yes. He was well educated. He knew how to write. Yes. Okay, and I'm sure it was an early version of Hebrew, because it there was there was that back in 1400 BC. There's no reason he couldn't have written it. 
but in order to tear down the veracity, the truth of the Bible, some parts were written by the Yahwist, some were written by the Elohist, and you know where they got these two? Was if you look at Genesis chapter 1, it's always God, Elohim. Starting in chap chapter 2, you get the Lord, or the Lord God. Okay, those two chapters, okay, and I say, so what? Because a lot of times, you read through the whole first five books of the Bible, and what do you get? You get God and Lord. If you read the story of Noah, God, Lord, God, Lord. And they're intermixed. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason to separate them. The priestly, they supposedly, during the exile, the Babylonian exile, wrote the book of Leviticus. And of course, somebody else wrote the book of Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. Now I have to say, Jesus quotes Moses and he specifies, if you read through the New yes, Testament, yes. Jesus says, as, the, as Moses said, as Moses said, Jesus believed yes. that Moses wrote the first five books yes, of the Bible. Yes, he does. He quotes it. I just read that today. Oh, okay. Yay. Yeah. I okay. Mean, that's, he does. He quotes Moses. So, so Jesus would not be saying, oh, by the way, that was some other. Yes, and we're going to get to one other thing here shortly. But the law, the first five books, were recognized as God's word. As, as The word is canonical. So if you hear me say that, it means they believed it was God's word. At the, by the time of the Babylonian captivity, those, the first five books, were believed to be God's in, God's inspired word. By the Babylonian captivity. Well, what about the rest of it? And if you've ever seen a Hebrew Bible, its order is way different than ours. Okay, you've got the first the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books, and you have the history books, which is basically um, Joshua to Second Kings, with a couple of exceptions. Then you've got the prophets, the major prophets, all and the minor prophets, except for Daniel, who gets stuck in the writings at the very end. Now Jesus... We know by Jesus' time that the canon of the Old Testament was pretty well set. Because he said, when he was accusing the Pharisees of hypo being hypocrites in Matthew 23, Whose blood haven't you shed from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah? <coughs> Abel, we know, was where? Genesis. Well, Genesis. Look, Genesis. The story about Zedekiah being killed? Second Chronicles. So Jesus knew that that's how it was all set up. Okay, everybody with me so far? Yeah, you said a sentence right before. You said, by Jesus' time, what? <coughs> well, it had all been set. But it's just the order is different than our English Bibles. Okay, so the Hebrew order. The Hebrew order is different. Right. If you ever look at a Hebrew Bible, it's easy to get lost. So... Um, the books, the writings, and the prophets were gathered as traditionally thought by Judas Maccabee mm -hmm. in 165 AD, but they were gathered by that time by someone. By the time of the rebellion of the Maccabees, the books had all been gathered. Now, I say books, back then they were what? Scrolls. Okay. Can you imagine this? being on an assembly of scrolls. Oh my God. I'd be dragging in. Did anybody have a paper route as a kid? No, my brother did. The, the bag that you carried. <clears throat> that's what we'd have to carry all this in, be one of those paper bags. Yeah, yeah, on both Praise sides. God for books, okay? Yes. Um, and like I said, Jesus acknowledged the Old Testament, but never the Apocrypha. And what is the Apocrypha, you ask? Mm -hmm. When the Bible was translated into Greek, about 250, 200 B.C., there were all these additions that they stuck in there, okay? Different books, different stories. And the funny thing is, they obviously were not in the original Hebrew because, especially with the book of Daniel, I love it when Angel affirms what I'm saying, 
Some of the additions to Daniel, Bell and the Dragon in the story of Susanna. This was in my Old Testament survey class in college. Yeah. There's all these Greek puns that you would not get in Hebrew. You know, word plays in, in Greek that you wouldn't get in Hebrew. Uh, what's missing from the book of Esther? Because it's one of the reasons Esther was almost not included in the canon of the Old Testament. God. There is no mention of God in Esther. That The word God, the word Lord, does not wow. appear in the book of Esther at all. But when they did it in Greek, they added all this extra stuff to make sure that God got in there somehow. So, yeah. So, um, when that when that happened, I mean, and you know, Jesus and I think it's interesting that Jesus and the apostles mm -hmm. used that Greek version called the Septuagint. If you look in their writings, they quote it's it's the Greek that they're quoting, but they did not quote the Apocrypha. Okay, now there were instances where. Paul quoted uh, Greek poets. Okay, mm -hmm. the, the the one we like to to say in him I live and move and have our being is from a Greek poet. And Jude included writings from a Deuterocanonical book, that, you know, about Enoch. Okay, that doesn't make the whole book scripture, but that one phrase got included. The Lord will come with his in his glory with his holy angels and ten thousand saints. It's in the book of Jude. So um Okay, back to this. I want you to make that point stronger. <laughs> about Jesus and the apostles quoted from the Greek Septuagint, but they did not ever quote out of the Apocrypha. Uh -huh. Why is that significant? Because the Apocrypha contains a few weird things. Yes. Um, actually, more than a few. It's where, <laughs> and I'm not putting anybody down if you happen to be Roman Catholic, but it's where some of the Catholic ideas right. come from. Yes, right. it is. Purgatory, praying, praying to the saints, that right. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's never; those were never quoted by Jesus or the Apostles. And there's just some of the books, Tobit and Judah. That's Strange bad story. history. Yeah. They're just bad history. Okay. Um, they are included, the Apocrypha, in the normal Catholic Bible. Yes, it is. Yes. Right. And in some Bibles, and I happen to have one, I've, I've read the Apocrypha. You have many Bibles. Um, the New Revised Standard, Standard Version has it separated out between the Old and the New Testament. Now, the Catholic Bible has it included, it's included. in, you know, wherever they fit. They don't separate it out. So, and there's some there's some good stuff in there. I'm not saying it's trash or garbage. There's some really good stuff in there. Especially, I would recommend reading the prayer of Manasseh. It's the prayer that he supposedly prayed when he was taken to Babylon because he'd been so bad. Remember, Second Chronicles says he was hauled off to Babylon, and there he repented. Mm -hmm. And this supposedly is his prayer. And it's a really good prayer. Um, there's also a song of praise. Um, that the uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego supposedly sang in the furnace. It's really kind of nice. I mean, it's just a nice little song. But there's also kind of strange little stories. Oh, there's bizarre stories in there. Right, about Jesus doing healing. No, no, no. I'm, no, no, no. I'm not gotten there yet. That's New Testament Apocrypha. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Perfect. Hang on, I'm just, I'm just now headed there. Okay, all right. Old Testament. Okay, the New Testament. Uh, one of the one of the things that I and I see this on Facebook. Some of my atheist friends like say, "Well, it was written by men, not by God. Written by men, not by God." Well, we've already gone through that. But and that the church one day, all the leaders of the church sat down and said, "Okay, these books need to be in there. These books don't." That is not what happened. People just assume that because a book was left out, that, you know, they, well, for their own reasoning, because they like what's in it, because most of it's heresy and New Age brouhaha, <laughs> they want it included for some reason. And that's not how it happened. The church did not just one day decide, okay, 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, etc., etc., etc. Those are, that's what it's going to be from now on. That's not what happened. Okay? Um, they had very strict, in looking at, at the canon of the New Testament, they had very strict criteria for whether a book should or should not be included. The first is, was it apostolic? Did an apostle or an acquaintance of an apostle write it? Okay? Um, as we know, Luke was not an apostle, but who did he, who was his buddy? The apostle Paul. Okay? And Luke wrote the gospel and the book of Acts. Paul wrote all those epistles, Peter, John, who wrote the gospel, his letters, the revelation, not quite sure who wrote Hebrews, but you can bet it was either Paul. I know Pastor believes it's Paul. I think it might have been Barnabas, oh, or, yeah. or even Priscilla, and, or even some have said even Priscilla and Aquila. I can go for that. But was it written by the apostle, an apostle, or an associate? Okay, of are you apostle? saying then that these people had firsthand knowledge of or eyewitness knowledge? They like Luke. Probably didn't see Jesus. Right. I know the Eastern Orthodox Church believes that he was one of the 72 or whatever. I don't think he was because he didn't meet up with Paul till much later, but he had Paul. Right. He had Paul. And Paul, and plus, Paul had a. Yeah. One theory is that when, you know, Luke accompanied Paul when Paul was in prison, you know, he accompanied him back to Jerusalem when Paul got tossed in to prison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they took Paul where? Caesarea. Luke could have traveled to Galilee, possibly even met Mary. Ooh, that just gives me chills. That's kind of cool. I mean, I mean, he could check other eyewitness accounts because that's, I mean, that could be the reason why his birth account is all about Mary, basically. It is all about Mary. Yeah. So. Ooh. Okay, so there's food for thought. Yeah. Then, well, because in one of the books that was disputed was called The Shepherd of Hermas which I've read. It's kind of weird. It's a vision about the church. and <clears throat> I mean, it's interesting. But one of the complaints was it was written in 140 A.D. Okay? That's way out of the Apostles' reign. Okay? Um, so, not only do we have this tearing apart the uh, Old Testament, we have what's called higher criticism, tearing apart the new. I don't know if you've heard about, um, I think it's called, is it called the Jesus Project or something? This was a few years back. Some scholars went through the Gospels and took out what they didn't like. What they didn't think Jesus actually did or said. So guess what got hacked out? The miracles. And most of what Jesus said, because Jesus couldn't have said that. Wow. I know, it's, it's it, it just, that. Well, remember the warnings. Don't take away from it. That's right. But higher criticism also says that none of the books are written before the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Which is malarkey. Sorry. That's just craziness, okay? Matthew was possibly written as early as 50 A.D. Now, that's pretty amazing. Um, some people think there is this mysterious document called Q, which stands for, in German, for quell. I don't know where the Germans get off on this. It stands for quell. It means source. These oral traditions... That supposedly the Gospels, the, the Synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were based on. I, I, I don't, I don't get it. I mean, I'm sure there were oral traditions about Jesus floating around, mm -hmm. which is why Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John put it into writing. Okay, so back to higher criticism. This is a group of people that said that none of the Gospels could have been written before 140 A.D. No, no, no. That. Now the before the of fall of Jerusalem. They were written before, before the they fall could not be written before 70 A.D. 
which was the fall of okay. Jerusalem. Okay, before 70 AD. Okay. Okay, like they really like the late date. For some reason, Luke. They like to stick Mark first, and then to say that Matthew and Mark copied Luke, or Matthew and Luke copied Mark plus this Q source to come up with their gospel. Why not just, I, I'm sorry, it boggles the mind. Mm -hmm. Why not just say, you know, Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark wrote, wrote Mark. Yeah, that'd be nice. Okay. Now, then, and I'm going to touch on that here in a second. Were these books free of contradictions? Did they bear any internal contradictions? Probably. No. no. If they did, they wouldn't be in the Bible. Okay. And did they agree with, remember I talked about the Bible being what? A unified whole? Mm -hmm. Did they go along with what was in the Old, in the old Testament, the Old Covenant? The Torah, the, the prophets, and the writings. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important point that we need to remember yeah. is the Bible is a whole. We love to divide it between the two, mm -hmm. but it is a whole. And yeah. the New Testament only shows you the fulfillment of the old. Right, it does. Okay? Yeah. You can't, I mean, Charles Stanley's son said, oh, we can do away with the Old Testament. Excuse me? Are you nuts? Anyway. Did it, and did it uphold apostolic doctrine? Now, what happened alongside the Bible was the growth of doctrine. Okay? Obviously, if you read Acts chapter 2, do you think they understood the fullness of the Godhead at that point? I don't. I don't think they had much of a clue. Paul, more than anybody, I think by the end of his life, understood that whole concept of a triune God. Um, but I don't think they had it. In, I don't think it was clarified. Mm -hmm. That kind of kept, you know, all those doctrines grew. The doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of end times, the doctrine of grace. Those things had to grow. By the middle of the second century, they had like a rule of faith. Very similar to like the Apostles' Creed. Okay. So, did these New Testament writings agree with that? Because if they didn't, they couldn't be in the Bible. There is an Apocalypse of Peter, which apparently was very popular. And But Jesus on the cross supposedly said, My force, my force, why have you deserted me? So guess what? It was kicked out. It was banned. Because it was, you know, that's not what he said. The Gospels all agree. It's my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Hmm. I guess it was a Star Wars Jesus. Yeah, it sounds like Star Wars Jesus. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> does it uphold apostolic doctrine? Okay, there are lots of other books. The Epistle of Barnabas, which I don't think Barnabas wrote. It's just wacky. I mean, I've read, it's just it's just kind of wacky. Um, there, now, this is what you were talking about. There's this... Um, Proto-Evangelium, which means first gospel of James, in which we find out that Mary was a temple worker and that her parents, Joachim and Anna, and they're never named, no. were really old and childless and she was like a miracle child just like John the Baptist. Oh, no. um, you know, and Jesus killing his roommates and resurrecting them. Yeah, stuff like that. Stuff like that. You know. Crazy stuff. And alongside this, alongside the New Testament, there was also not just that, but Gnostic works, you know, her heretical, New Age, we would call, I would call it New Age, all that kind of stuff going on. So, ooh, running out of time. Um, this is good. It's good stuff. Now, a couple of things. Jesus' words were held up as scripture. First Timothy five eighteen. Where, G, where Jesus, or Paul, was actually quoting Luke 10, 17, the worker is worthy of his hire. But that's scripture. He says, this is scripture. Paul said, this is scripture. Like the scriptures say, the worker is worthy of his hire. That was Jesus' words. So even by Paul's time, 
the words of Jesus were counted as the word of God. Um, and I love this in 2 Peter chapter 3. The first time I the first time I, I caught this, I was like jumping around. It's like, wait a minute, this is so cool. Second Peter chapter three. Um, we'll start part of the way down through. Well, we'll start in fifteen, toward the end of the book. And consider that that the long suffering of the Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul according to the wisdom given to him is written to you as also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scriptures mm -hmm. Peter counted Paul's writings as scripture okay so even by 64 AD when most of Paul's stuff had been written anyway, Peter said, look, this is scripture. Um, early church, there was a bishop of Hierapolis in Asia Minor named Papias. I love Papias. He believed in a literal millennium, so you gotta love him. But he gave the earliest canon list of, of New Testament books. All four Gospels, um, most of the rest of it, except for like Second Peter, Revelation, Second and Third John, those are those are disputed for a long time. The interesting thing that he says about Matthew, which is one of the reasons I believe Matthew was written first, not just because it comes first, but he said Matthew wrote down his Gospel in Hebrew, and others interpreted it as best they could. If that's true, and Matthew wrote it in Hebrew, who was he writing to? Jewish believers. Okay? So, I mean, that, that's an amazing statement. He also said that Luke wrote from information he received. Mark wrote, so Mark was not really an apostle, but who did he accompany to Rome? Peter. Yeah. Mark wrote down the memoirs of Peter. Yeah. Okay? Um, well, like I said, Gnosticism also started to rise. So uh, he was counted an arch heretic, the main one, Marcion, decided he didn't like the New Testament, didn't fit in with his doctrine. So he took away every gospel except for Luke. And even Luke, he took out the first two chapters as being too Jewish. Obviously, he was anti-Semitic. Paul's letters were the only letters that he let in except for Paul's first and second Timothy and Titus, because again, too Jewish. Marcion believed in two distinct gods, the God, the unknowable God, that's a big Gnostic thing. You know, the God that you couldn't know, and then this lower God that actually dirtied himself with matter. Very, very Gnostic thing. But he came up with his own list. So the church came up um, about that a little bit later, what's called the Moratorian Canon. This was about 170 AD. So that included more of the books. Eusebius, the great church historian who bond all over Constantine, talked about, he divided you know, the books that were universally accepted, the ones that were disputed, which was still like Revelation. I think people even back then were scared of that book. Uh, second, third John. Okay. He, but he came up with that. And he, he listed the ones that were to be excluded: the Apocalypse of Peter, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Didache, the Epistle of Barnabas. Those are not to be read in the churches. And then, finally, well, not finally, but I, my point is, see how the church—they didn't just sit down one day. This was a growth thing. This took time. Many years, yeah. Athanasius, my Christian hero, Bishop of Alexandria, what the bishops would do, they'd send out letters to all their churches in their area, telling them about the date of Easter, because apparently they couldn't figure it out for themselves. But in his, what's called his uh, festival letter of 367 AD, he also included, you know what, these are the books we're using. 
and it's it's the books 27 books in the New Testament exactly like we have it today and it, but see it took three and a half centuries to get there and it, what even that wasn't enough they held the church held a council in Carthage in like 397 and said okay he's 27 no more okay so it wasn't that the church my point about all that was the church didn't just sit down one day and say well no yes no no yes yes no this took a long time yeah, yeah. and there were some books that almost made it in to the New Testament thankfully they did not because they did not meet those criteria wasn't written by an apostle was it used in the churches did it hold up under scrutiny of what we already know what the rest of the Bible says yeah that's good that's really good yeah. any questions mm. okay so next next week I'll be teaching on the uniqueness of Jesus why my whole point was you can't I was going to talk about that this week but I thought no we got to get the basis if we can't believe we can't trust yeah, so, the Bible oh, this is good this is great if we can't trust the Bible then why even talk about Jesus right. 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 so I want to talk about that next week that'll be the 10th and the 14th on our Sunday service I'll be going through the prophecies regarding Jesus I have a question yeah. um, you had mentioned something about 178 AD mm -hmm. included more books yeah the, the um, well, moratorium canon that, oh, don't yeah it's, oh, okay. just to show that the, you know they, they, did inc they did agree on more books and oh. more books as time went on Fantastic teaching. So, Facebook, thank you. Uh, don't forget, you can see this on YouTube probably tomorrow. Madeline's very good about that. Maybe even tonight, I don't know. But just go to YouTube, go to capital B, capital O, capital H, capital M, space global, and you'll be able to find this, not only that, but also all the series on healing, some teachings I did on the second coming. You can also see our 44, is it? Uh, Sunday morning services on heaven. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again next week.